central question. I'm just going to read it to you um, so we're all very clear. Um, nearly 48 years after Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, how has the American theater fared in its pursuit of gender and racial equality? And so to engage in this conversation, um, we have brought together seven amazing, wonderful playwrights to um, each who are in the middle of amazing careers discuss um, what they feel is happening in American theater as far as race and gender. Um, now, how, we're just going to sort of play around with having each person sort of explain and discuss you know, their, their place in American theater. It'll become a conversation, and then after the conversation is over, we'll actually open it up for you guys out there. So what we need for you to do is sort of tweet, and you can tweet using new play hashtag, and then sort of towards the end of this conversation, we'll come and sort of engage. Um, so let me introduce everyone first. Um, first off, we have Maria Allen's speech, who's play, she's very good. Um, whose play Little Monsters received its world premiere at Brandeis Theatre Company in association with Primary Stages. We also have Rada Blank, whose play C will premiere off-Broadway in September 2011 in a co-production with Classical Theatre Parliament and Hip Hop Theatre Festival. We also have Bridget Kelso, a 2009 member of the Emerging Writers Group at the Public Theatre here in New York City. We also have Winter Miller, whose play in Darfur premiered to sold out audiences at the Public Theatre here in New York and also helped raise awareness of genocide in Sudan. We also have Dominique Marceau, whose play Following to Nellies debuts at prime, sorry, premier stages in New Jersey this summer, this 2011. We also have Deepa Perohit, a co-founder of the Rising Circle Theatre Collective, whose Play Rise Festival offers a developmental home for playwrights of color. And Betty Shamia, whose play Roar premiered at the New Group and is now being taught in college courses around the country. So welcome to all of you out there, and welcome to all these amazing playwrights. I'm very happy to be here. Um, so let's sort of just jump in. Um, I'm just curious to know what you guys feel about what you do. So you know, just think of everyone being sort of uh, not quite sharp. <laughs> um, and explain to uh, us or each other what is the role of the playwright? What is the the journey of a playwright? If you can, anyone can start. I'll start. Um, I feel that one of the roles for me as a playwright is uh, to, and I feel like so many playwrights say this, but you know, to give voice to the people in our own lives or in our communities or in the larger world community that we feel don't have voice or that their stories aren't being told. Um, for me, uh, my my role and goal as a playwright is to uh, address some of the things that I have questions about, you know, and that I want to engage the larger community in uh, helping to answer some of the questions. So it's about me channeling my questions to the audience and having them become a part of the solution finding rather than. Um, than me finding the solutions by myself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in breaking down barriers uh, between different groups and in using theater as a tool to create empathy and compassion. Um, because I think it's it's when we know someone's story, when we when we fall in love with them, then we have less of a desire to do them harm. And when there's more humanity in the world, then there's more room for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the rest of us. For me, it's um, as a role of a playwright and then also being part of uh, being artistic director of a company, it's to not only give voice to the stories and, and, and break down barriers, but it's to inspire people in the audience to connect to those stories, to tell their own stories, mm -hmm. so that they feel like that wall is broken and they can walk off and say, hey, you know what, I experienced something like that, and, I, and, and somebody else did too, I'm not. I'm actually not alone in this, and I think that's part of the role. It's really interesting the idea that um, writing with an agenda as, as women and as playwrights, I think that our agendas for writing, our desire to write, is very specific to us being women. I don't know if male playwrights think about maybe more barriers or have this aesthetic or, or feel this need or connection that I feel that I feel is the echo here. The idea that my agenda is very specific when I write. Like I have a, a 
purpose. I, I have a, a need, not just for my own expression, but to make connections with other people. I feel like that's very specific to women, specific to women artists. I don't know that I, don't know that I agree in the sense that I think that if you are a member of an oppressed group, then your desire is to connect. And I just sort of was thinking about, say, Larry Kramer's normal heart, that he had a clear mission of, I need to tell the story about what's happening to my community. So if you come from the most privileged group, then maybe you don't have that same desire to break down barriers because you're not really feeling the barriers. But I think if you're not um, a white, well-educated Christian male, then probably you've got some kind of barrier that you want to break down. I was really attracted to theater specifically as opposed to other art forms, other forms of writing which I still do, because I was very excited by the idea of having a blueprint, creating a blueprint in which people in different communities could create. And I think that's something that was always very attractive to me about theater. I mean, it's so strange what we do. We shine lights at a certain part of the stage, and everyone faces one way, and we pretend it's real, and we get emotional reactions to this thing that is not real. And to me, that was fascinating. And I think it's really interesting that all this is coming to the head about talking about women issues because I didn't really know I was a woman playwright until my second off-Broadway production. Because being an Arab American playwright was so overwhelming and mantle to hold that it, it, it's very funny to me that I, I, I had to learn a little bit more about, and it came from the critics and how I was, my work was seen. But I, when I was creating, I wanted to create the Arab American for woman. I wanted to, to look at, you know, because Blanche Ross spoke to me, and even, even though Southern culture is, is very specific, um, just like Irish American culture is very specific, for me, I came into the theater world thinking I could do that, and, and I think 15 years later, I'm still struggling. I'm now facing the fact that, wow, okay, maybe it's not as easy to change perceptions. And just to speak from my own personal experience, I think the, the big answer would be, I want to create work that um, let, lends itself towards healing somewhere in the world. But honestly, theater was the one place where all these different parts of my voice could come together. I, I consider myself a member of the hip hop generation. And, um, um, and I've also done stand-up comedy, but in response to social justice issues. And I feel like theater is a place where all these people these parts of my voice can come together without compromise. You know, um, in hip hop, there's just, you know, certain rules, you know, especially when you're a woman and a woman of color, at least in terms of the industry is concerned. And um, I didn't want to adhere to those rules. And in terms of, you know, acting uh, as an actor, uh, working in mainstream, there was also some rules about look and aesthetic. And I didn't want to adhere to those. And I feel like theater is the one place where I can bring all these places, these, these parts of myself together and feel, and yet feel very whole as a person. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, I write because I feel like I should write. I, this is what I can do to lend my voice towards healing in the world. But my own personal mission or my own personal reason for doing it is because it's, it's where I feel myself, honestly. I kind of, I have a, um, I have much more, I think, of just a, a visceral sort of approach to theater, which is that I've always been a storyteller, and for many years I thought I was going to be a fiction writer, and then um, the writing for has actually been talking me into going into theater, and I think that, I think that, um, that, that it, I, I have a journalism background, and, and theater is, Theater is the one sort of medium that, that if you have an imperious urge to show someone a particular truth about the human experience, it's the one place where you're, I almost call it the work of the gods, you know, where you can put people in a space and truly show someone in a very specific space and time what happened or what happens in, in a story. And so I, I, I didn't realize that part of my work as a playwright was also going to be that this, what we're doing now, which is, which is to also, you know, um, ask the the powers that be to give us a chance to do this, mm -hmm. um, because because I think I'm pretty good at what I do. I, I didn't realize it would be actually so hard to get it done. Right. You hear, you hear? Well, that's a very interesting point, and I kind of want to illuminate on that. Um, 
you guys, um, and Bridget in particular, talked about um, having a particular agenda or sort of being, I don't know if you were saying that you were actually able to put into an agenda where you have to sort of break down barriers. Um, no, I just, I was saying that I, I feel like the, the female agenda, the female playwright agenda seems very specific to me. Mm -hmm. like we approach it from a different point. Right, okay. So, so let me just add into that. I'm curious to know what barriers do you guys experience? I mean, Rada was talking about writing because she wants to create a sort of sense of humanity. Um, Winter was saying the same thing, but in that pursuit to sort of share your humanity to, with the world, what are the barriers that you come up against? And are, are, the, are those barriers fair? Um, are those barriers expected? Um, do you have uh, a sort of solvency in your mission to change the way theater looks as far as women's presence and position? Um, I like to say, I thought that was something interesting between what both Bridget and Winter are, were saying about um, whether you're writing from, as a woman from an agenda or whether you're writing generally just from being the oppressed, which, you know, women are of that class and, you know, women of color are of that class and, you know, so then I think that we all, uh, I think I agree that if when you have a, um, a relationship to feeling, you know, there are barriers, then even if you're not writing intentionally from that place, even if you're not trying to, to crack down barriers, just the action of you writing is, it, it is contributing to that, whether you, you know, decided for it to be or not, you know, uh, in, a, in a space where we have, where it's so hard to get our work to put up. And I think, um, I think some of the barriers that I've experienced have been, uh, uh, a, a reaction, reactionary a little bit. You know, like I, I, I witness things and I don't see myself counted, like my reflections of me or where I would feel like my voice fits and I don't see that being reflected in the theater that I'm seeing produced on stages. So to me, the barriers become psychological a lot of times. You know, like I, I see these images that don't reflect me and I go, and, and it, it psychologically tells me there's no place for me here, you know? And so that they're not, uh, I'm not, that doesn't mean that they're not literal. You know, it's not like follow my head, I'm making it up. <laughs> but really, Dominique, if you just didn't have that mental barrier, you know, that's a real barrier, but it becomes a psychological barrier because I, 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 I see what I'm up against and then I go, well, where does my work fit? Where does my work fit? So then I can try and there are theaters that maybe welcome my voice or are excited about my ideas mm -hmm. or whatever. Maybe there are theaters that are interested in producing my work, you know. But there are also, uh, when I look at what's being counted, I can only look at what's being done and say, hmm, this track record's not so great mm -hmm. in terms of me feeling like I have a place where I belong. You well, know? Can you give any specifics to what you say you're up against? Well, I'm curious about. for instance, um, I spent some time at the O'Neill last summer. And, you know, and I felt very warm and welcome there. I was the only playwright of color um, in the National Playwrights Conference. Now, there, were, uh, there was another playwright of color in the Musical Theater Conference. Okay. Um, and so while, while I was among the women, we were in the majority of the men you know, that were selected at the conference. Like, there were more women playwrights in the National Playwrights Conference than men. And so that felt, we, we celebrated that, me and my women peers, you know, we're like, oh, look at this, you know, and the guy celebrated with us, like, oh, look at this, right. <laughs> you know, this is nice, you know, um, but I was the only person of color, so that meant I'm the only woman of color, and that's just the only black woman, the only woman of color, you know, and so then that let me know that there, even though we are, our, these women's voices are being supported, and we're starting to, to get some recognition, depending on who uh, is running that mission, um, we're still not, the women of color are still not being brought into this with equality either, you know, so we are still facing barriers as women, and then also as women of color, you know, and I, uh, I think that that's an important part of that, and that's just from what I'm witnessing, but I don't just witness it as a playwright, I also witness it in casting, when I see shows being done, um, at all of the, the theaters that I've seen work at this year, great theaters that I've seen work at. I've seen work at MTC, I've seen work at, you know, Playwrights Horizon, these great theaters. But when I look at the uh, shows, I don't see a lot of uh, people of color being represented in the casting. Because then that tells me that, you know, either non-traditional casting is not happening mm -hmm. or 
uh, these plays aren't right are not right. These plays don't include roles mm -hmm. for those, mm -hmm. those people. I, I think that mm -hmm. sorry. Um, you guys are just yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I think it's really important that we make a distinction between active censorship and lack of opportunities. When we talk mm -hmm. about race or gender, what we're really talking around is the other article, which is resources. Mm -hmm. And exactly, I agree. And you know, my first show in New York was called Chocolate and Wheat Road in America. I wrote it, I produced it for four hundred dollars at the French Festival and I acted it. Now it was a show subtitled Growing Up Arab in America and all the characters were Arab but they didn't talk about it and they were just people. And I premiered it a month before 9 11. And it was just kind of like I wanted to invite you to a show about ethnic people and then just show you a show about people and ask you to make your own conclusions. Right. Now a month later the world changed and so people off, but, mm -hmm. but I think you know it's really important to remember and to feel empowered in that we have to be very careful about how we talk about what kinds of changes we want because if it's about getting certain institutions to allow more of our voices by embarrassing them, which is a tactic and a, a primarily an effective tactic because if you're taking corporate, city, state, and federal funding, saying you're you know, supporting people of color and you're not doing that, or you're not supporting people to the extent that the law industry is or the medical industry is, and you're taking federal funding, that's another thing. But I think, you know, it's very important for me in these conversations to remember that, you know, there are people who are actively sensitive, their voices are not being heard. In, and it's similar to what happened to the African American community at the turn of the last century, where they have to go to Europe in order to work. But what's different is now we live in a society where we imagine that there is a level playing field because of all these all of these institutions saying that they're doing these things and not being able to do them. And specifically for the Arab American community, but it's for any community that is the most dangerous at the time. And you know, when I grew up, Russia was the big scary thing, you know, and I can't wait till 30 years from now China's gonna be the big scary thing. And I grew up to just now. being but I think it, I think it's really important to delineate between censorship and lack of opportunity so that we know how to target people who can give us more. Mm -hmm. What I was just mm -hmm. going to say really quickly is that I think this was so profound for me about this conversation because one of the unspoken I think that is is this sense of fear of speaking out about mm -hmm. certain things that we we've noticed and that we've witnessed and that we've experienced. I think there's this unspoken rule of like don't complain, which I don't think we're complaining. I think we're trying to challenge the industry that we, you know, we, we live and work in. Um, but there's just kind of this unspoken rule when, you know, regardless of what your frustrations are as a playwright, um, or you've been told your work is too narrow in scope, or you know, you're just not fit mm -hmm. for our theater, um, and then want to know why that is, and not get you not get a clear answer. There's just kind of this rule of just like don't. Don't shake the boat, don't rock it. You want to get produced. And that is what really gets under my skin, is that my work speaks to certain truth. But as a playwright, I'm kind of discouraged from being honest and being truthful. And in the fear of like, well, if we, if we speak in this broadcast, like, how is that going to affect our careers? Mm -hmm. what, you and I keep having this conversation about how novelists can create books. And Toni Morrison creates books that challenge racism, that challenges the very industry that she's in, but she still has a, a, a livelihood in that very industry. But as a playwright, I mean, it's kind of just, no one speaks about it, but like, if you challenge artistic directors, or if you maybe um, speak true to the, the voice in your very work, you may be considered problematic. And so I think that this is this is this is really important to me that we have this conversation because I do see fear as not as a tangible, you know, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I've 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 experienced and I'm still relatively new in my career is this conversation about audience. You know, like who is your audience? And whether or not the audience or the audience that's perceived to to uh, attend a particular theater will connect with your work. And I feel like, just like the writer can be marginalized, so can an audience. I mean, who's to say that um, the typical audience at a, at a particular theater won't want to hear something different? So I think the, the idea of like who your audience is, I mean, I think that my work may speak 
to a certain segment of society, as uh, Dominique spoke about, that may not be heard or often talked about or are visible. But as a human being, I mean, what does it matter if I look like that person on stage? It's like I, I wonder sometimes if artistic directors have bought into this idea of, well, I don't know how my audience is going to take this right. So that, to me, is a barrier for both me and a potential audience. You know. Can I speak to the artistic director um, part of it? I, I think that is such a, a, an amazing point. As an artistic director of a company that's been around for 10 years, not very visible, but 10 years ago when um, I started the company with a, a colleague of mine, he's African American, I'm Indian American, and we were like, hey, let's umbrella into people of color. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about people of color and what that meant, I would constantly get but it's an Indian theater company, right? I said, no, it's people of color. And it was a constant push to get those words out. Now we're in an age where everybody knows, we all accept what that terminology means. It's rolling off of our tongues. And I feel like we're, I'm, I'm in a position as an artistic director and a playwright to do something. And an artistic director of a company that doesn't have a huge budget, but our mission is to get the work of people of color out on the stage, get those voices and those voices that we don't hear out there. But um, one thing I would say about what you're saying is that um, there's not enough, in terms of a barrier and what you're speaking of, there's not enough safe spaces, spaces that we can call a home, whatever you define as a home. To say, yeah, I don't actually feel like, and this is ideal, of course, but I, I think I created this company because I felt like, look, this space doesn't exist where we can actually be without the sort of elephant in the room. And actually, just the other night, we were in our lab, and the playwrights were talking, and one of them said, you know, we don't even actually even talk about white people when we're in the room, because that piece has been removed. We're not like, we're actually just talking about the characters in our play, and we're mm -hmm. accepting that your play is from, is people with, um, uh, with um, heritage from China, your play is with people with an African American heritage, and your play, and we just sort of accept that as status quo, because that's, that's what it is. So I feel like you're right about the artistic directors, and I think, the one last thing I would say is that as, as a person of color, and I come into this conversation as a person of color first probably, before I come in as a woman, I think I'm still coming in to my identity as like woman playwright, woman artistic director, um, because of the mission of the company and what I've been living with for the last 10 years. Um, I, I do feel like there is, um, in terms of ownership, we need to own, when we say we want to own it, that means we own our, our creation of it, the budgets of it, how we look at how we spend our money, the business side of it, the enterprise of it. Um, and to me, that's really important. And it's important for me to be transparent with the people in my company about that because, you know what, we're all people of color. We need to know this. Right. We need to know how these decisions are made and why they are made and why we are told no and why we are told yes and why it seems random and why sometimes it's not absolutely not fair. So just to bring that sort of into the mix as well. I also think that, um, that there's a, a cultural component that, um, that we need to look at. Uh, I was talking yesterday with Lou Moreno, the artistic director of INTAR, about this conversation. And you know, one thing he brought up is sort of like that curve that um, an artistic director has to go, that, that, that sort of, um, that sort of uh, learning curve of how do you work with a woman, how do you talk to a woman, how do you treat a woman in space, and, and how you know, we're, we're kind of coming into this new, into this new kind of moment where, where I think that the, 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 this conversation, this, this, something's expanding. And, and I'm thinking about sort of like my own development as an artist, and I think there's a lot of goodwill for development out there among artistic directors and among people like that. And, and, it, and I just think that like that the cultural anthropology is not completely there yet. So like when I'm talking to an artistic director, and maybe you know I'm Venezuelan, and so maybe I'm like a little bit more outspoken, or you know they're like whoa, you know like there's this whole kind of ease in the playwrights that are also produced because they're they're very culturally acclimated to the community, both to the audience and to casts and to, cap and to everyone. And so part of what I think needs to happen is also this conversation about what do all of these cultures coming into the scene mean for how we interact with each other, mm -hmm. how we look at the work, how we trust the work, I mean, how we how develop we the work. Other. You know, mm -hmm. like, I, I think that, that an artistic director, when he doesn't produce a play of mine, 
um, he might be thinking or she might be thinking, you know what, that, this play might get slammed by a critic, so I'm going to go with something that, that, you know, there's also this right. kind of protection that might come into play. So, so, so all of this together means that this conversation is really elemental, not as a way of, of alienating, but as a way of saying, look, you know, there's, there, there's actually like tangible steps that we need to take in order to be more inclusive because none of us are going anywhere. We're sort of here to stay right, yeah. and either we do, either we move towards like an apartheid type of situation where like every theater is just producing all these different ethnicities and we all feel safe and we see each other at cocktails and mm -hmm. once in a while someone produces somebody else's work. Or we really take the next kind of, you know, very courageous step mm -hmm. with the audience, with the critics of saying, we want to try something new. Please forgive work you don't quite understand. Please understand we're trying to do something really great here in in in, in sort of coalescing culture and creating you know creating really important sort of mirrors as well as bridges. But you know what? I think people think that that's happening already. Yes. That's the disconnect yes. to me. I've heard conversations like this before. People think that they're doing that already. People think that that's occurring. And they also think. I mean, it's very interesting because I don't look traditionally Arab, but some woman came up to me recently and she said, you know, I can't believe this old play Born Bad won an Obi. You know, mm -hmm. Gats should have won an Obi. It's all those people of color. And it was so funny because I was like, it, you know, I didn't mean to mention the things that wow. she said, but but it was so funny. It was so funny to me because the backlash against even this kind of conversation. And so I felt like, wow, you know, I never met her and she had never met me before and she felt entitled to spew this kind of entitlement about you know, people of color and to a person she thought was on her team. Mm -hmm. And it was really eye-opening for me. And I, I said, well, what do you do when you face somebody like that? And I said, how do we engage people? Because I feel like there's people who care and they care lots about this particular subject. How do you engage mm -hmm. people? And I think what it has to be is about taking our place as intellectuals Theater is about ideas. It is about challenging. And I feel like, for me, I would love the conversation to shift, to talk more about the content of the work that's being produced rather than just the color or the gender of the person. You know, because for me, and I know that that's tricky and probably not a real popular approach, but for me, if there's going to be a thousand Catherine Bigelow's in the morning for that terrible war movie in which the only thing American soldiers do is detonate bombs at Iraqis put on other people. You know what I mean? Like, right here. You know, like she's a woman, but she's doing a story just about men. To her winning the Oscar for me is not an achievement. Mm -hmm. If you're not, you know, and I feel like one of the ways to engage and to push this conversation past is like, you know, Rwanda has more women in their House of Representatives than any other country in the world. That's how they dealt with the genocide. We don't see those images. We don't, we, we, and I feel like I would rather see a play by a white man that is more that challenges our assumptions rather than a play by an Arab woman in which, you know, Arab women are oppressed. Mm -hmm. well, I, what I was just going to say is that how do we know that that play is not sitting by that, a great play by an Arab American woman is not sitting on the desk of an artistic director? I think, I'm going to be honest, is that I think there's this idea of point of entry. Like, where does this audience, again, this universal audience, which is not really universal. Come on, universal is becoming like a bad word. Like, where does this mainstream audience, um, how do they, where's the point of entry for them? And so, I'm not, I'm not, I totally agree with you, Betty. I think content is important. I'm not, I don't want to rally behind a playwright simply because they're female or because they're of color. Um, it should be about the work speaking to the human existence. But, I, I sometimes sit at night, and not for myself, I just think about what plays are sitting on these desks uh, of these artistic directors, and what about the, 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 the conversation, what about the playwright, because it really is about personalities also, whether or not you're white, whether or not um, you're problematic, you're problematic <laughs> whether or not you're, you're intellectual, educated about, about Sometimes it's about pedigree, mm -hmm. um, but I, I often wonder about those plays that I know are of content. I, I, I mean, I feel like I know so many amazing playwrights, 
who are constantly knocking on the door just to get their play read. Do you feel, like there's, so, do you feel yeah. like there's a certain um, expectation as far as what you should be writing about? Like, do you feel like theaters are, like Winter has a play that comes across the literary manager's desk. Is the expectation that this play needs to be about a woman's story in order for it to be produced? I don't think it's, so. No. Okay. I don't think so. I mean, I've heard other playwrights talk about the, the feeling of the expectation of, you know, what they should be writing because they're a person of color, so they think they're supposed to be writing about that, or they're a woman. So but I, I, I really don't think so, but I, I do want to address about a little bit because she's spoken about audience and she's spoken about, you know, um, artistic directors. And I have to say this, you know, like, the, to, to think of these audiences that are going to the theater, and I don't think theater is solely an intellectual sport. I think that's part of the problem is that it's, we, we, we're becoming kind of elitist in our ideas about theater, you know. And theater is as much for, I mean, for the for all of the people, not just a particular talented tenth of the people. It's a, it's for everyone, you know. Everybody has a, it's, it is emotional as much as it is intellectual. You know, we can transcend and help each other and raise each other up and, and as well as challenge each other and make each other feel. I mean, it, I I think when the soul and that emotion gets lost in theater, I'm I'm, I'm less interested yeah. in it, you know, <laughs> because it is that's part of what it's about. And I saw some great shows this year that I said. I saw a small fire at Playwrights Horizons, so which good. no one on that stage reflected me, and yet I felt so connected to that play and those people, and because it was it was great it's writing, good. it was good acting, you know. But and I, so I felt I do feel like there are um, entry points into all audiences when a when a story is is. Uh, universal, but I think what universal does not mean is to wipe out people's specificity. I think universal right. means that we have very specific things about us that make us human. Right. That make you have very specific things about you and you that make you human. That's totally different. But there's a thread underneath right. that, and I think that the same with Whipping Man. You know, there was a lot of conundrum about um, uh, uh, a Latino playwright writing about black slaves from a Jewish owner. But I saw that play, and I thought. I felt I felt an entry point into that play because I felt like, first of all, I just saw, wow, this is some like this is some sexy writing. You know, what I mean, I got excited by the, the the fight and the character, and I think that from a base of a playwright, what's more interesting to me before I even put my agendas out there, I'm like, who am I? Who are the people out? I'm interested in like what kind? Of, what what are those voices and those? How do they talk and like what's their swag? Like what's that? What's interesting mm -hmm. about these people to me? That that is. That, that's the thing that makes something universal. Not like washing away right. your, your identity so that you're not specifically you, you know? And I, so I, I think that the audiences that go to theater now can appreciate work from, you know, mm -hmm. from any and everyone. And I think that um, theater, but, but artistic directors, I feel like maybe challenge a little bit themselves by how to reach other audiences, you know, if it's hard to get some of these audiences that haven't been seeing reflections of themselves into the theater, so how do you do so? Then we go, well, I can't, I mean, I understand artistic director. Like, if I'm an artistic director, I'm like, look, we got to get folks into our theater or it's not going to be good to anybody, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I empathize with that and I say, look, we, we have to figure out a way to, to work together and not just challenge, but maybe create solutions together because if we feel on the defensive all the time because we feel like somebody offensive all the time. We, we don't really have a, a way to align. And I mm -hmm. think that there's more, I think there are possibilities in how we can really align with theater and help them to see things as opposed to um, us always feeling like we got to be on opposite ends and fighting. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have to fight. I think that's, that's what I, I meant about, um, you know, I certainly don't believe, by, by intellectual I mean, uh, I, I mean taking the forefront exciting new ways to see each other, and that means humanizing and complicating mm -hmm. what the images that we see. I mean, that's that's for me why I'm doing theater. But I also want to speak a little bit to your point about um, what I'm trying to do is further the conversation, because I feel like there's a juggernaut of, you know, people feeling like this conversation is about us, and we get angry, and, and we don't really reach and move beyond. And what I'm saying is theater is itself in trouble. So if we can galvanize and, and make connections between other people who are very interested in using this art form to further and complicate and excite, I think it's a better frame in which to have this conversation. Because I feel like, like that woman that I encountered, 
we all get very excited, but it doesn't really lead into anything unless we are part of a movement, and that leads to right. social change. That leads to other, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, I feel like there's this conversation. It's very easy for people to shut off, and I know because I've had this conversation with people so many times. So I'm just trying to to to, to speak to that. Can I ask a couple of questions? I, I feel like part of this conversation is sort of one slice of theater that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a trajectory of people submitting their work. To, our, to large or regional theaters or mid-sized theaters in New York City. This is a very specific professional trajectory we're talking about. Right. There is an absolutely whole world, other world out there. And I understand that there is money that's tied to this, meaning the playwrights pay and their, what, they, what their salary is. But I think if we're gonna talk about innovation, I feel oftentimes most angry about the paradigm we put ourselves in when we take the exact trajectory that's historically been the trajectory instead of saying hey let's shift it up it can't be that hard to get other audiences into theater we go into schools we go into different communities we bring it to them live and everybody engages sell tickets have a season be off broadway go from off off broadway to off broadway to broadway yeah that's hard that's hard that's one slice of theater. It's not the democratic theater that I necessarily, I love it, I think it's necessary, I think we all want it, and that's a great way to get our work out there, but I think this conversation is a little bit narrow in terms of how we are bringing theater to communities. How are we taking what our substantive content is that you're talking about, engaging people and saying, you know what, you're not just watching us, you're a part of this, and you're going to talk to talk about who you are. Tell me who you are. You saw this. I'm not going to sit up here in a panel. Let's hear about who you are and what your experience was with this particular thing. That's where I feel like innovation and pushing the ticket and pushing the paradigm is. I can knock on 100 artistic directors' doors right now and say, they're going to say no to me, hands down. They're not going to give me a chance. They're going to say you're Indian or you're, you know, none of your things can be produced too many characters. Blah, blah, blah. That's going to be there till the end of time, it's just like, what else are we doing? Right. What are the paradigms that we are creating and shifting in order to not coexist with that? I'm not saying get rid of it. We need that. Right. That's, that's money making, and lots of people have succeeded from that. What are other paradigms that we're doing? Are we searching in our minds for those? Are we doing them right now? We don't even know it yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to be the, the next Tyler's conversation, too. <laughs> 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 you get this even though it may not necessarily be offering specific concrete steps like you're talking about, I feel like for me personally, I need this conversation, whatever the outcome is, whatever yeah. whatever its meaning is, is necessary for me as a playwright because I don't have these conversations. I've never had the chance to sit down and talk with other playwrights about these issues. So I think it's really important that even if it is, um, Sort of, oh, well, this is what's wrong, and why can't we do this? If it does have that tone, to me, that's still important. I, I would like to see, uh, in terms of working towards a potential solution, or at least something that shakes things up, is um, what if we use Title IX as a model um, for theaters? And Title IX changed the sports arena. It wasn't necessarily designated for sports, but it said, if you're going to give money uh, if you're taking federal money and you're an educational institution, then you need to give women the same things that you're giving men. And it upped participation in sports. It upped the number of sports for women and the sports available for women. And I think the same thing is entirely possible in theater. These theaters are cultural slash educational institutions. A lot of them have educational arms. Yeah. And they're receiving public money. They're receiving federal money. They're receiving state money and city money. And so my question is, why isn't it discrimination if there isn't a certain amount of work that's being produced by a representation of the people who are in that community? It's, it's not like there's only one playwright of color who's out there writing and that, that person just keeps getting passed over. There are all these writers and there are more and more of them. So why aren't the demographics of who's getting produced changed? And, and in some ways, yeah, unless we shift the paradigm, it's top down. So if it's going to be top down, then I want to say, give, give us some affirmative action. And I will give up my slot to someone of color if it's my slot, because I'm interested in that. Right. You know, when I started applying mm -hmm. to colleges, affirmative action came in. And I knew, I knew that the woman next to me got in. We have like the same setup. But I knew that 
one woman next to me got in because she was a legacy to that school, and the other got in because they wanted people of color. And I felt like, this isn't my time. But how do you, you, you can assume that. You don't I can assume sure. I'm not positive, but when you, like, when you stack up, and it's a controversial mm -hmm. thing to say, and affirmative action and quotas are very sticky, but when you take like things, when you take like um, grade point average and SAT scores and curricular activities, and you look but at a group of people. College essays. I mean, there is an element of it that isn't just, you know, like, these are your SAT scores, these are the colleges you get into. So it's really hard to make those kinds of things. You know, I, I, I support well, your, what you're saying. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm willing to admit that it's not, it's, it's not a, it's, I'm, I'm using a personal example in order to say that for me, my experience was, I think that that was, I've experienced that, and I feel fine with it. I feel like we're not all starting from the same, uh, we're not starting at the same starting line, and so there are times when I need to give over to something. And it's not because I'm better, but if someone is equal to me, and they haven't been given as much representation, then I would like to see that person have the representation. I appreciate I, I, what, what she's saying, actually. I'm sorry, I, I, I was trying to with you, Alice. I, I appreciate what she's saying because I was thinking about this, actually, and, uh, and, and thinking about coming to this conversation. I was thinking, like, how do we balance the, how do we level the playing field? And, and to me, it's not a matter of, like, I think it's important that she said it's not a matter of equal, you know, it's not a matter of equal talent or equal, you know, in, you know, intellect. It's a matter of opportunity. And I think when we talk about an employment, I think we leave out employment when we talk in these conversations. And employment is like, you know, real. I mean, like, people need to be have jobs, right? So like sometimes when I think like when we get into these problems and we go, oh no, I don't I don't talk about that race thing. I'm like, look, it's not about your personal taste. It's not to me it's a matter of employment. Like let's just look at employment numbers. And you can say there's a disparity in employment. Yeah. With women, we know this, right? Like this is on the national platform. This is just like theater is mirroring the, the country, you know, so it's not like these are not real issues. These are, this is employment. And so I think when we look at that base, something like what we're talking about, about targeting so that we can create a little bit more balance in the theater is not a, uh, it's not a one-sided idea. And I think that's an important issue. That was what, what would happen if there were quotas? And it was just the idea of for three to five years, there need to be X number of plays by Women and you know, like I think it's, there has to be I, that take federal funding. funding. I don't. I think if you take federal funding or yeah, you know, corporate funding, yeah. that makes sense to me. But maybe I think not corporate, but federal. But I pay taxes, right? Okay. I, I, but well, I so I'm gonna have to yeah. cut into this amazing, amazing <laughs> discussion. <laughs> uh, we have some folks who have been tweeting and they have some very interesting <laughs> questions they yeah. want to sort of <laughs> share with you. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love it. Um, <laughs> so the first one, um, I'm going to. Uh, Valerie Curtis and, um, Newton. Hey, Valerie! Yeah. Hey. 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 Um, uh, her question is, is the mainstream audience really interested in assessing new points of entry? Yeah. We can't assume that they're not. Yeah. I mean, uh, is, who, is there somebody yeah, out there who was interviewing every everyone. single person exactly. who, you know, you know what I mean? I feel like, well, we're audiences. I mean, we're, right. interested in, yeah. we're interested in it. Here's you know, the thing. Audiences are interested in stars. So if you get the stars mm -hmm. from these communities, they'll be interested. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, if, if you're given the same attention and level of production as other writers, you know what I mean? If you put Denzel Washington in an off-Broadway play, people will be interested. But, but, right? but, but wait, wait, wait. As a person who works in, does a lot of community theater, work in community, I don't want to assume that people I, I, yes, you will get a lot of people showing up if Denzel is there. But I think if we put the same amount of effort in promoting yes. something that we do, like the new sneakers on 125th Street, I saw like, I don't know how many black and brown men on, lined up on 125th Street for the latest sneaker, and I started asking them, are they going to be voting <laughs> when it's time to vote? Like, if we put the same amount of effort, and I don't know how, who exactly, the, who needs to come together in ensuring that, but if we put the same amount of effort in tying their their identity, their growth, their health to this experience of theater, we won't have crowds around the corner. Mm -hmm. But we have to we have to put the value and effort right. into it there. Right. I, I also think that um, that you know mainstream theater 
but even other theaters have fallen into this trap. When you said stars, I thought that that's what you were actually yeah. talking about, which is that they've fallen into a trap of, of developing names rather mm -hmm. than right. content right. and mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. And so now so what happens is that, is that, well. yeah, and so, and so and some of them are terrific playwrights, but you know, you can tell sometimes their output is like fantastic, but sometimes it's like, you know, maybe you should have taking six months off and, and gone and volunteered in India or something. So, uh, so you know, so like, in the, so in the process, if like, in the process, if like, there were some kind of, I, I always believe like change culture at the conversational level first so people understand yeah. what it is that the problem is, because if you enforce something, you create device. Whereas like, what we're saying is, if, you know, I've read, I've read, I've read like mind blowing plays by so many women out there that are, are sitting in their in their computers right now. And if a little space were opened up and and decision makers were, you know, and, and probably a lot of them have read these plays and a lot of them probably love these plays. But if there were a system where they said, you know, um, you're not gonna get the, these three names that we that we know or these five names that we know, you're gonna get someone new every season. You're gonna get two people that are new every season mm -hmm. whose works are exciting. We start to change the mm -hmm. mentality of the culture right. and of the exactly. audience. And if we say honestly to ourselves, this is what we want to do. Mm -hmm. This is a hardcore civil rights issue, human rights issue. This is, you know, we're stuck here and let's move there. And this is our goal. And we move towards it with a lot of love and attention and diligence. I do think we can start to see a change without Pissing each other off in the, in the Honestly, process. our mission for the company to get player people, the people, of, the stories of people of color on stage. I don't know who would have bought that ten years ago and said that's your only focus, like that's all you're going to do. And I'm not saying we proliferated New York. We would love to do that, but I think as I see audiences come in to see the work, they get it. They start to yeah. it's time. It's also right. cultivation. Yeah. So yes, it's a hunger. I think it's too. a hunger out there now, and there is, it has been a hunger. It's just getting those right. folks who are hungry right. and having them lead the pack, I think. And that sounds idealistic, and it's not easy work, but you have to be committed and dedicated in order to do it and take it on. Look, I don't do producing white plays very well. I, I do do this well because right. I'm very passionate and committed about it, and I think that's what you need, people who are passionate and committed about changing what is going on with the audience. But the question was mainstream theater. It was very specific. Uh, yeah. the the and I would say yeah. 10 years, I surely hope this is part of it. Here's another interesting tweet question um, from Little Miss Uku. Um, hey. <laughs> how have you felt typecast as a playwright? You know what? <laughs> I just want to say that I think that that um, success typecast playwright, mm -hmm. and that that I, there's part of me that wants to stay on the margins because I want to be able to write what I'm called to write. And I think about uh, John Ware in his li his last play, uh, Free Man of Color. Um, the the houses in Lincoln Center were so often empty, and this was one of the most audacious and beautiful and rich plays I've seen. And I think the audience was like, "But well, we came for House of the Blue Leaves," you know, and, and didn't know what to do. So I think that there's typecasting that comes in when someone wants to do something that's out of what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think. You know, there's, there's any. You know, our names are just coming in on a, on, a, on a play. They don't know who we are, or you know, I, I don't know what race Dominique more. So I, I'm like, that's pretty. Maybe she's French. Right. You know, <laughs> which other people don't know if I'm a man or a woman. Or, you know, so right. there's a certain amount of anonymity that that does happen. But I think as you as you do work, you get you get pigeonholed into, oh well, she writes about the blank experience mm -hmm. and that. Right. You know, I'm personally interested in not doing that and in trying something completely different with each play so that I have as much freedom to explore that. Right. And it means, you know, my stuff is not seen as mainstream and is not, you know, people are not saying, when's your next, right. you know, you can't wait to put that play about the 19th century French hermaphrodite up. Right. <laughs> well, right we all waiting for that. <laughs> 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 I'm waiting for that play. It's almost ready. <laughs> yeah, you, you, know, you, you touched on this in that panel discussion at the New Black Fest as well. Like there are certain tracks that people get on, and there are certain trajectories. Like if you kind of go through Juilliard, if you go through NYU, like there's a certain cue that occurs as well. People start to expect a certain amount, of, a certain type of work from 
this type of playwright who comes through this sort of system, and there's room set aside for three people this season from these certain tracks, and sort of everyone else is, you know, might be able to fit in if you can. Right. So I think that that's another way people get typecast. Mm -hmm. Sort of these tracks that are sort well, of. When you say tracks, I mean part of it is the networking of. Um, like, for example, if people who go to Juilliard want to work with people who went to Juilliard. And the more people from Juilliard are working, then the more, like, there is a, there is a thing that, that also makes sense in terms of tracks. That when you know, when you admire someone creatively and you've maybe gone to school with them, that you continue to work with them. So there is... You're creating a sense of community, but I, but I, I think we, well, at least what I feel like we've talked about mm -hmm. before is this idea of, um, you know, the... Um, the institutions kind of taking care of their own, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. and how, you know, I'm not going to lie, like I've applied to all of these programs because I know it would make a big difference in my getting produced. Mm -hmm. If I had a stamp of Juilliard, mm -hmm. um, it's not to say I don't want to learn because I've never actually um, been taught playwriting and go to a program for it. So I know that um, for all the, you know, truth I'm kind of speaking, I could use some structure and some craft mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know that if it said write a blank from Juilliard or write a blank from Yale or what have you, I know that there might be more eyes on my work. I mean, it's, it's just definitely a reality. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, we, we I'm sorry, we have actually five more minutes. So oh, I just want to throw out this last tweet, mm -hmm. and then I want to ask you guys about some solvency mm -hmm. plans for how you're going to do So this is, from, <laughs> <laughs> this is from Christine Sumption. So quickly, so you know. Hey, Christine! <laughs> um, what? Can, what can, should theaters and other art organizations be doing to address this inequality? What's being done that works? So maybe that's part of the solvency. That's part of the solvency. Yeah. I have, okay, so <laughs> I was thinking about this too. We're thinking about a lot of these things. Um, I think, uh, I just watched this documentary on Freedom Riders. And yeah, um, really it's on so PBS, go and look online and see it. But what I, I find moving about this movement is that uh, people were willing to continue the journey when other people could not continue the journey. When this group got shaken up because they got abused, then the next group came in, and then the next group came in, and then the next group came in. And what I really think is important, and it, it kind of touches a little bit on what Winston was saying, I think that this this uh, problem cannot be one that only the marginalized people get involved in. That's a problem. Right. The, that's a problem. You know, the, 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 the road to liberation in this country and in other places in the world have been because outsiders have recognized, even if I'm not personally impacted by that, I recognize the problem in that because somehow I am, I am yes, impacted right. by that. Yes, I'm right. connected to that. If, if there's no balance in theater, then I'm not having a balanced experience in life. So that impacts me and I need to be a part of this uh, this commitment to trying to get more voices heard. I need to be invested in that too. So I think that part of the solution is in, uh, is in appealing to our peers that are not necessarily just in our communities. Our communities, the people that are impacted need to be involved. And then so the outside communities that say, okay, well, I'm of this particular privilege. I don't have that problem. I'm, I'm a white man. I don't have that problem. I have other problems, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say there are white men who can't get produced because of whatever they're writing, you know. But I think that if we become part of a collaborative fight, then we can't, then we, then we have to see change happen because everyone's involved. It's not like, oh, the women are arguing. So that's all, that's the women's problem. So we don't have to deal with the women, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, no, I'm a man and I say, the women have a, a point there. Right. We need to do something about that. And if they have a problem, then I have a problem. Right. I think uh, one thing I'm really invested in is, is, is giving value to this other audience or, mm -hmm. you know, to really change what audience is. Um, we're putting seed up in Harlem um, off 125th Street, a National Black Theater, and you know some people like Rada. You, do you really want to have your premiere of your, your, yourself as a playwright that off, 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 off Broadway? And my answer is yes, because I really value the people from that community. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have this play. You know, um, so it's like, how do we value um, different audiences? How mm -hmm. can we create? really great theater in different audiences mm -hmm. and not look to these just mainstream and really have the same, no, maybe we don't have the same money. I understand that is yes. an issue. 
but to still try to have the same production value and give that audience the best effing theater that they could ever experience and the because more, they deserve it. And the more that you mm -hmm. do that, I, I feel like people start to see that. We do that in our company. What's the solution? I'm trying to work on a solution right now with a group of people who are dedicated to getting the voice of people of color out there. So what we're doing is not only developing playwrights and getting their work out there, but we're also taking theater to communities just like you are in the sense of we have a solo Asian American show that went to Queens for a high school group of women. We have a show being developed right now, Charity Hunter Ballard, yes, um, she's yeah. riding Muddy the Waters, and that's going up in the Bronx. And that's going to come down, because you know what? It is about the people in the Bronx. It, that is where her story is coming from. And I think the more of us that do that, that really bring it to the communities that we see, the more of us that just stay committed to that, people become drawn. I mean, our audiences are not just people of color. Sometimes our audiences, is a lot of white people in there. So I think there is possibility in, in creating that solution and, and doing that, working off of one another and doing it in our different spaces to, to help build that momentum. I think it's also, you know, I think it's also understanding the, the sort of numbers and probabilities and, and how much of an attrition game this is. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of my strategies is like, you know, I've noticed I've it like over the years that the rejection letters are signed by a more senior person every year. So it's like the intern's assistant was like the first year and then the next year was the intern. So like I figure there's also like, like working really, really hard uh, to become a better playwright and, and I can see my own curve of improvement over the year. Just not, you know, like George Wolf said, that um, he, he recently, I heard that he said that he felt like he was at a slot machine and everyone around him kept winning, but he couldn't move because he'd invested so much money into his home. So a lot of it is just about like, you know, not moving. I'm, I'm starting to throw my rejection letters away. And the other thing is that I try not to go to theaters that think have no people of color in their season. I mean, that's my mm -hmm. own little protest is that, you know, if you're not going to produce people of color, I, you don't want me in your audience. And I think well, I'm gonna have to actually be part of that too. We're going to gonna have, unfortunately, we're going to have to Stop this now, but you guys obviously will continue to have this conversation. Hopefully, all of you out there will continue to have the conversation and certainly understand that we are all a community, we're all one to sort of have this exchange and sort of make theater move forward. Um, so, I want to thank you all for viewing this amazing conversation. Um, thank the you, Green Network. Thank you, Green Network. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.